Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Nessa Carey, who has uh, written a number of books, all in the area of genetics and epigenetics. Um, Her most recent book is called Hacking the Code of Life, How Gene Editing will rewrite our futures. Um, And then you've got a couple classics. Uh, This one from, I guess, about a decade ago, uh, Mm -hmm. The Epigenetics uh, Revolution, How Modern Biology is Rewriting Our Understanding of Genetics, Disease, and Inheritance, which I found super fresh, even though, I guess, you know, more has happened probably in the last 10 years (laughs) in in that book you said. I think these guys are going to get the Nobel Prize pretty soon. I think they got them before the ink was even dry on, on the book. Um, And then you've got this book called um, uh, Junk DNA, A Journey Through the Dark Matter of the Genome. Welcome, Nessa. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here, Greg. Now, look, I'm an outsider to this field, and so, but I'm fascinated by it. And the way I kind of look at it is sort of from the perspective of information theory, right? (laughs) You know, information (laughs) economics or, you know, software, right? Because I I love to joke in my Mm -hmm. class that, you know, we are all creatures of software, right? But I think we're only just now starting to understand how complex that code actually is. And I was fascinated when you pointed out that only 2% of our DNA does what we thought, you know, (laughs) DNA was for, which is to kind of uh, make proteins. And um, so I want to talk about, first of all, like that, the process of that discovery and what the implications are and what the resistance to it has been. Um, but just to kind of summarize this idea of, of epigenetics, kind of the way I think about it, it is, you know, you've got this, this zygote and uh, it's almost like a general who is sending troops out into the field and saying, all right, you know, here, here are your marching orders. And every single soldier in the army has the exact same marching orders, except, you know, some of it is blacked yeah. out and some of it is highlighted and everyone has a different set of highlights and dark outs. <laughs> But that, you know, in addition to sending out these marching orders, everyone also gets a, a like a Xerox machine and, and a software editor, and then they get a manual for the, for the machine and instructions for the editing. And within them, they also have, you know, instructions around copying the software, copying <laughs> the, the manual and, and, you know, building out new kind of Xerox machines. And somehow yeah. this all has to happen, <laughs> you know, and, and somehow manage this division of labor that, that our body is. It, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, now, so the human body contains about 70 trillion cells. Um, it's an incredible number. I calculated that if you counted one, per, one cell per second, it would take you a million and a half years or something ridiculous like that to count all the cells. And every single cell has exactly the same DNA, like your marching orders. And yet cells are completely different from each other and they do completely different jobs and they never change those basic marching orders. They just use different bits of them. And I always think of it as a bit like um, a script for a play. So you can see two different versions of Romeo and Juliet and they'll use the same script, but the productions will look totally different because of the way that text is interpreted. And that's what's happening in our bodies all the time is that we have exactly the same DNA material in every single cell in our body, but we just use it in different ways. And that's what epigenetics is. And I find it absolutely mind blowing to think about. And I also find it mind blowing that for a really long time, we kind of pretended it didn't happen. And we acted as if the only thing that mattered was that basic DNA template, instead of thinking, okay, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient for life. Um, We sometimes forget DNA is one of the most boring molecules in the universe. If you stick DNA in a test tube, it will do nothing. And it will do nothing for a million years or a billion years or however long you leave it. Uh, So I kind of love that we're at this stage of genetics and biology now where we understand how lots of stuff that we didn't understand before happens at a DNA level and above. And we accept that the software is incredibly complicated. Yeah, but unlike uh, kind of the ratio of text to stage instructions that we might find in say a typical Shakespeare, you know, with the occasional, you know, exit right chased by bear. I mean, it's, (laughs) it's, 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 what is it like almost 50 to one, right? The ratio of stage instructions to text. Exactly. Um, It's 
it's one of the things that I think it's such a beautiful example of human hubris is we always think we're going to be so different from other every other species at the most fundamental level. So essentially, when the human genome was sequenced, we expected that we would find 100,000 genes. And this is using the old definition of a gene codes for a protein. We expected we would find 100,000 genes. Um, because we're so clever and complicated and much more sophisticated than other species. And we found out that we have exactly the same number as just about any other animal. We have about 20,000 genes and that most of our DNA does not code for those sorts of genes at all. So 98% of it doesn't. And again, what I love is that in biology, we dismiss stuff when we don't understand it. So that was why it was called junk DNA. It was all that other 98% that did nothing. Instead of going, hmm, 98%, that's an awfully high figure. Do you think maybe it could be doing something? We didn't know what it did. And so therefore we said, oh, it does nothing. It's just junk. How unlikely is that? And yet we did that for a long time. And we do this all the time in biology. I, I'm a professional biologist, um, but it's something I'm very aware with, with my discipline is that we, when we don't understand something, we go, oh no, it's not important, rather than thinking, hmm, maybe it's important. Maybe we should look at that more. So when we hear that um, we share, you know, 90% of our DNA with a sunflower, right? Yeah. Presumably that's just referring to the, the gene component, right? Uh, it can refer, yeah, it can refer to the gene component. It can refer to the overall genome. It's actually incredibly complicated to do those comparisons. Mm -hmm. And you can come up with different figures depending on how you do them. So, um, I particularly love the ones that relate us to bananas. I don't know why there's something funnier <laughs> about being related to a banana than a sunflower. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we're X percent banana. Um, so they're really complicated calculations to do. But when it comes down to it, we are very similar to particularly, obviously, our closest relatives like the great apes. But we're very similar to other forms of life on Earth. Uh, life on Earth uses a relatively narrow color palette of genetic information. And we're pretty similar to pretty much everything else. But that I think is the exciting bit that all the all the fabulousness is in the detail. That's kind of extraordinary to think how much diversity of life on Earth is created using this relatively simple genetic alphabet. That's pretty mind blowing. Right. And I don't think you had a statistic in the book, but you know, I've heard claims about how much data you can put into sort of a single strand of, of DNA, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's enormous. And is, is, that, is it so large because it's not simply, you know, ones and zeros, but because we have, right, you know, four letters that we can leverage? We have four letters, which helps, um, but it's actually the huge scale of it that really helps. Um, so each of us inherits three billion base pairs letters from our mother and from our father. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that sometimes if just one of those is wrong, if just one in 3000 million is wrong, you can have a really terrible genetic disease. So the DNA code is important. But I think what's so important about the DNA code is that it is so large and it is so subtle and sophisticated. So yes, you create the proteins and those are really important, but those are kind of the end products. It's all the regulatory mechanisms that are built in. And because you have such, we have such a large genome, we have the scope for an awful lot of regulation. Um, and it can happen in 3D as well. So we think of our genome as being very linear, but actually bits of the genome will interact with each other. And then you have this other layer of information on top, which is epigenetic. And so it's, it's kind of an exponential system. Yeah, it's, it would be rash to think too literally about DNA just being like software because there are interrelationships within DNA and additional levels of information on top of it that make it at least hideously complicated software. And we're really only at the beginning of understanding how it all fits together. Now, I want to go back in time and kind of talk about how this field uh, evolved, right? And, you know, you talk a bit about how you know, this really is a revolution, right, that is following in the footsteps of, of Watson and Crick. But I mean, at least since the early days, people must have understood that, right, genetic expression 
matters because, you know, we, we don't have, we're not all made of nerve cells, right? We're not all made of liver Absolutely. cells. So, so they must have understood that there's a, you know, some kind of switch, which, um, you know, leads yeah. cells in one direction or the other. And I love this Waddington's landscape because I use sort of similar types of graphics in my strategy classes that yeah. I borrow from evolutionary biology. So Waddington's landscape is great because it's basically this hill and at the top of the hill you have a marble or a ball or whatever and the hill is full of peaks and troughs and little channels and so the ball starts at the top and it can end up in any of the channels and the analogy is that's what's happening with cell differentiation that we start with the zygote which is the one cell formed when a sperm and an egg fuse and then that divides to form two cells they're both an eight and 16 blah 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 and we end up 70 trillion eventually and the idea is that those cells they're like the balls that end up in different parts of what, uh, Waddington's landscape. So some of them turn out as nerve cells, some of them turn out as skin cells, et cetera. So we had, a, we had that model which told us that cells differentiate, although we knew that anyway. Um, what Waddington's landscape suggested was that it's very difficult to go backwards, that energetically you go down all the time, you don't go backwards. So nerve cells don't suddenly become a different cell type or they don't become a nerve precursor. So we had that as a descriptor. And we also knew decades ago that two things could be genetically the same and yet be phenotypically different. They could look different. So the cells of our body are a great example. But also there used to be this phenomenon, not well, there still is. Basically you can create gen genetically inbred mice. So they have exactly the same DNA. And you keep them under exactly the same laboratory conditions, and they're not the same as each other. So they vary in things like body weight. Um, and this is one of those examples where in biology we're really sloppy sometimes. Whenever anyone was asked for an, exam an explanation for this, why these animals that were genetically the same and environmentally the same were different from each other, the answer was always it's, all, it's an example of intangible variation. <laughs> which is a great way of saying we don't know, but doesn't that sound scientific? That's like doctors say um, that, etiology yeah, of unknown a, origin, right? Etiology of origin, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. <laughs> that sounds better than saying, haven't got a clue. Right. Um, and so we knew about all those things, but we had no way into working out what the molecular basis of them was. And with epigenetics in particular, epigenetics for a long time was a descriptive term. It basically meant two things are genetically the same, but for some reason they're not like each other. What became really exciting from about the 1980s onwards was that researchers started unraveling the mechanistic basis behind it. So we didn't just have a description, we've started to get explanations and that's really exciting. But it meant it was a very um, slightly disreputable field for a while because there was the dogma of genetics was everything, DNA was everything. Mm -hmm. All these other bits and pieces were just weird little variations and they didn't matter. Um, and so I think epigenetics has been a great example of how you get paradigm shifts in scientific fields, that you just get this situation where there's the prevailing theory and it survives a lot of onslaughts, but then eventually it crumbles and the new theory emerges. So it's been a great field both scientifically, but also in terms of the philosophy of science. But, so yeah, the, we knew it was happening. We didn't know why, so we pretended it wasn't important. Right, and, but the main idea is that, you know, it's, it's an on-off, there are on-off switches or dials. And I think that was sort of that you said some of it's really more like dials, but the, the, it's, a, it's really essentially a, a bunch of if-thens, right? So if you encounter this yeah. in the environment, then you tap into, you know, this set of, of code. And if you encounter that, then you tap into this set of code. And at the very basic level, the environment just consists of what, like, you know, where you are in relation to the other cells, right? So if you're over here, That's you become exactly placenta. It. And if you're over here, you know, you become fetus. And if you're over here, you become an ear. And if you're over here, and, and so that's the most, that's the most basic form of environment is just, you know, what cells yeah, I mean, if you take the example of the single cell, the zygote, the one that can become anything, the cell that can become anything, and it divides to two cells, to four cells, very quickly, that small number of cells start going down different routes. And the environment there is probably the presence of proteins in mm -hmm. the interior of that cell. 
that they will not be quite evenly distributed. So if you think of a particular protein, um, there's one called bicoid, for example, just by chance, part of the cell will have more of it, more of that protein than the other. When the cell divides, that environment, those two cells no longer have exactly the same environment. And that, but that might be random. And that, would be, different. and that would be random, right? That'd be so, random. Yeah. That would be random. Um, but it's enough to trigger different types of gene expression and to trigger the epigenetic mechanisms that keep gene expression going in particular directions and get those cells moving down Waddington's epigenetic landscape. So the environment can be as simple as what's the environment within that cell when it divides. And again, this has been incredibly difficult to explore because we don't typically have good ways of looking at tiny protein levels in single cells. So it's one of those situations where, again, we've tended to ignore a lot of the stuff that's happening outside the nucleus in cells, not because it's unimportant, but because we didn't have a way of looking at it. So biology is often driven by what technologies are available at the time. And so we frame our questions in that way because that's what everyone wants to get to. They want to get to positive results. You can't do that if you don't have a, a mechanism for exploring the question you're interested in. Now, you, you also mentioned that there were some folks that were very skeptical about this important role of junk DNA, and you pointed to some evolutionists and, and some others. And, and I think one of the arguments was sort of a, I guess it was a, a selfish genetic matter story, right? Where there mm -hmm. are these just sort of high, these parasites that just kind of hijack themselves in there and, and somehow <laughs> yeah. perpetuate themselves, right? I mean, we know that there are sort of viruses that have been been domesticated. But is 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 that what the argument is that they're they're simply um, yeah you know. it's for some I have to say sometimes I do just create trouble for myself because writing a book on epigenetics and then following it up on a, with a book on junk DNA which were two of the areas of molecular genetics that annoy some people most was possibly asking for trouble. Um, and what we understand now is that the epigenetic system, which is this way of turning genes on and off, and the junk DNA system work really closely together to control gene expression. I think what we get is we get an awful lot of dogma that we get people very wedded to particular ways of thinking and particular theories. And it, it's kind of interesting because we're all supposed to be scientists and we're all supposed to be dispassionate about this. And of course, nobody is. Yeah, you know, there isn't a good scientist in the world who is dispassionate. People do research because they're excited by it and so on. So we saw a lot of pushback about the role of junk DNA, which is now changing. People realize that these regions that don't code for proteins are very important. We see that people are accepting much more, that epigenetics is incredibly important, but it's taken a long time. And even just probably about four or five years ago, there was a huge, huge row about the importance of epigenetics based on, um, oh, my mind's gone blank. Um, is, the is the ENCODE project? No, no, there was a huge amount. Um, the author, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who wrote the book, mm, yeah. great books um, about cancer, the, um, and who wrote the great book about the gene. And there was huge pushback because he had an article in the New York Times talking about the importance of epigenetics and suddenly everybody piled in who didn't like epigenetics. And I think we become strangely tribal in our support for theories. Um, so you end up with people, there will be some people who are saying the most important thing is genetics. Other people saying, no, no, the most important thing is epigenetics. Then you get someone else going, the most important thing is transcription factors. The reality is biology is very, very complicated. All of those systems need to work. If any of them fall apart, the whole thing falls apart. But we are surprisingly tribal and surprisingly wedded to our own theories. So yeah, I think in biology, we quite often don't realize that we're constantly putting ourselves on Gartner's hype cycle. Mm. And everybody gets very invested in whichever bit they like and where it is in the cycle at the time. Now, the mechanisms, you dig quite deeply, I think, into the mechanisms, and you talk about kind of, you know, methylation and acetylation. So are those the, the, the two kind of things that lead to, high, you know, the, under, the highlighting and, and, the, and the blocking out? So I'm going to go a bit geeky now. So we always think of DNA just as the double helix, 
of DNA, but it is actually coated in proteins as well, particular proteins called histones. And those are really important in controlling gene expression. So methylation of the DNA itself was the first epigenetic modification that was really identified. And generally speaking, though there's always exceptions, if you get a load of DNA methylation on a gene, it switches that gene off. And when cells divide, they pass on not just the genetic information, but particularly the DNA methylation information as well. So that's how, say, when the brain cells are starting to develop in the fetus, DNA methylation will switch off the hemoglobin gene because hemoglobin is a pigment to carry oxygen around the blood. You don't need it in your brain cells. So DNA methylation is fantastically important for switching genes off. And that's where epigenetics acts like an on-off switch. But those histone proteins, the proteins that are associated with DNA, they can also get epigenetically modified. And confusingly, they also get methylated, though it's kind of different from what's happening on the DNA, and they get acetylated. Typically, acetylation switches genes on and turns up their expression levels, so it's like a volume switch. The methylation of histones is more complex. It depends where it's happening, et cetera. But actually there is a huge number of other modifications that can happen as well. And it's the combination of the modifications that can make a difference. But again, because researchers basically identified histone methylation and histone acetylation first, they're the ones that have had the most money put into funding research into them. They're the ones that everybody focuses on. Typically that tends to mean that they're the ones that everybody thinks are most important but it could just be that we identified them first. So again, we need to be quite careful in epigenetics that we don't assume that something is the most important thing just because we found it first. It's and a horribly so that, complex system, by the way. And, and so that, that accounts for the continued downward trajectory, right, in the landscape. So once exactly. there is some kind of methylation, then any cells which are daughter cells to that parent yeah. cell inherit that that methylation exactly right? and so they become more specialized and that's why cell types don't flip that's why um the original title i wanted to give the epigenetics revolution was no teeth in your eyeballs um but my <laughs> right. my publishers said it lacked gravitas um, and that we wanted to be a bit more serious than that but that's why we don't have teeth in our eyeballs are the cells that give rise to teeth and the cells that give rise to eyeballs have exactly the same genetic information but they have different epigenetic information and some of that epigenetic information is incredibly stable. And so cells stay as particular cell types. And yeah, that's how they end up in all these little different dips at the bottom of Waddington's landscape. Now, part of the story, I think, in the epigenetics revolution is about, you know, some heroes in the book who sort of showed that, you know, you, you, can, you can go back uphill, right? And so, yeah, when, so, so, when awesome. they, so when they cloned Dolly, right? And this is now, I can't believe how long ago this was, because I remember mm -hmm. when it was front page news, but when they cloned Dolly and you know, I actually know some people who have cloned horses, right? And, yeah. <laughs> and, but, you know, they, they will clone them from a cell. That, I mean, they, they don't even go to stem cells, right? They, they will go no, to... No, that, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, the very first really convincing work in this was in frogs, um, which was um, carried out by John Gurdon, who did win the Nobel Prize. I felt very smug for having having predicted that one. Mm -hmm. And he, what he showed was that you could take cells from an adult frog. You could, you could take the nucleus from an adult frog cell, put it in another frog egg, and the nucleus would develop and you'd get a new frog. Uh, sorry, the cells would multiply. And so all, the, all the methylation would be stripped off, basically. Yeah, he had no idea that that was what was happening. He didn't know how it was happening. But the most important thing about his work was that it showed that when cells reach the bottom of Waddington's epigenetic landscape, it's not that they have jettisoned bits of DNA. It's not that they have rearranged any of the DNA so that they to end up as different cell types. What John Gurdon's work basically showed was that you could push cells all the way back up Waddington's epigenetic landscape, which means the cells at the bottom of the landscape and at the top must have exactly the same DNA. They're still containing the same information. Then that got, um, that was further validated with Dolly the sheep. Dolly the sheep was so important because she was the first cloned mammal. So it showed that 
even in mammals, which we think of as the most evolutionarily advanced animals, even in mammals, a zygote, the cell that's the sperm and the egg when they fuse together, contains all the same genetic information as terminally differentiated cells. Nothing is changed at our DNA. We keep the script completely stable. Um, so those were, those were vital experiments for showing that we don't move down the landscape by changing our DNA. There's another level of regulation on it. So yeah, they were extraordinary experiences. I find it fantastic to think that these days people clone horses and cats and dogs. I mean, it's mind-blowingly expensive and it's incredibly low efficiency, but it is kind of extraordinary to think if you have enough money, you can get somebody to clone your favorite pet for you. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is why some creatures can regrow limbs and stuff. And I think you said that, you know, therapeutic uh, genetics is a field that is probably going to develop. Um, and I guess this was 10 years ago. I mean, have we have we gotten to the place where we can potentially replace, you know, insulin generating cells in people's pancreases? I mean, we're, we're very, we very close that? now. We're very close now on that. Um, and that's because you can create new in insulin producing cells. Um, so the other great breakthrough in this was work by someone called Shinya Yamanaka. He shared the Nobel prize with John Gurdon. And he showed that what you could do was you could just overexpress four genes in adult cells and they would become like um, embryonic cells again. So in theory, we can create things like new islets of Langerhans cells, which are the cells in the pancreas that create insulin, we can put those into people who have diabetes. One of the things you have to remember though with people who have type one diabetes is they wiped out their own cells via the mm -hmm. immune system. So it's not yet clear if you can put new cells into them and they'll, they won't do it again, they won't just wipe them out again. But we're seeing extraordinary advances in certain types of therapies because we have this ability to reprogram cells um, that's been fairly extraordinary. Rather more extraordinary, however, though, in terms of how quickly it's making a difference to human health is actually the stuff that's covered in Hacking the Code of Life, which is the gene editing work, mm -hmm. where we are now seeing things like sickle cell patients who haven't had a crisis for 12 years, uh, sorry, 12 months, um, because their own cells are being genetically edited to correct the, def the defect that's present in sickle cell disease. That's the most extraordinary technology. No one's ever seen anything like this ever before. Um, so, yeah, all the, we're seeing all of these technologies and all of these insights being used in different ways, in lots of exciting ways. Some of them lead directly to therapies, which is fantastic. And some of them, what they do is they allow researchers to create new models and new understanding so that they can identify the best routes into new therapies by understanding diseases better. So it's a very exciting time to be interested in genetics. Mm -hmm. Now, those early experiments where they would inject the DNA into a egg cell, right? I mean, is that is it because that environment is one that is preconditioned to kind of put some kind of paint stripper on the on, on, on the DNA because <laughs> that's of that's a brilliant explanation that's a brilliant description actually I shall pretend that I thought of that myself I really really like that yeah if you take the nucleus from a cell and you put it into any other cell let's say you took the nucleus out of a skin cell and you put it into a liver cell it's not going to create a, a new organism the brilliant thing about the egg cell is that the egg cell in the cytoplasm, in the bit outside the nucleus, contains an extraordinary accumulation of different types of molecules. And they actually drive what's happening to the DNA. And your description of paint strip is really good. What basically happens in that situation is that that fabulous soup of molecules in the interior of the egg trigger reactions in the nucleus itself that strip away most of the epigenetic information and allow it to start again from scratch as if it were just that single cell zygote. You'll see, by the way, I'm waving my hands and using very descriptive terms. We still don't really understand how it works. Um, we just know that it does. And that's one of the 
big questions is what are those actual molecular steps that do that? But it is pretty extraordinary. It's kind of a control alt delete, but it leaves intact, right? <laughs> this this marker, right? So the sperm, for instance, what I found this fascinating. You you can't well, I, I don't know if those folks in, in China that you write about in the latest book uh -huh. managed to do this, but what I found interesting is that while you can strip away, you know, all sorts of methylation, there's some stuff that stays behind, including right, the uh the the you know yeah. the, the gender marker, right? Absolutely. So you um when when you get a in particular it's mammalian cells that really show us fun stuff here when you when you reprogram mammalian cells when you drive them back up to the top of waddington's epigenetic landscape yeah you strip away most of the epigenetic information but not all of it and that's what happens naturally as well in when a sperm and an egg nucleus fuse the sperm nucleus is carrying dna that has epigenetic information on it that's basically appropriate to make sperm work properly. And the egg nucleus has epigenetic information on it that makes an egg nucleus work properly. When they fuse together, you have to get rid of most of that information because you don't want the new, the biology doesn't want the new cell to be an egg or a sperm. It wants it to be the zygote, the one that can become anything. So it strips away most of the information and starts from fresh. But there are some regions and they're called imprinted regions where this DNA methylation in particular is protected because it seems to be really important for starting off the new process of cells dividing and differentiating. And these imprinted regions come marked with epigenetic information that basically says I was inherited from mum or I was inherited from dad. And the balance of them has to be right. Otherwise you get conditions, um, there's one called Prader-Willi syndrome, there's one called Angelman syndrome where development goes wrong, the children have neurodevelopmental issues, they have metabolic issues. But the key thing about this is that by having areas that are protected, it creates the possibility that epigenetic information can be changed in parents and passed on to their offspring. And it's very, very clear now in organisms like mice that this happens. And this is totally heretical because that would be, that's non darwinian This is Lamarckianism. It's Lamarckism, absolutely. And that's a complete no-no. Um, so you know, somebody like Richard Dawkins, for him, that is absolute anathema. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear though, that this is happening in, certainly in inbred strains like mice. Um, under laboratory conditions. Um, weirdly, it doesn't turn out to be the imprinted regions that everyone thought it was going to be that get that seem to mediate this. Um, scientists such as Anne Ferguson Smith at University of Cambridge have done fantastic work on this. And again, it's an example of one of those things where we think biology is nice and straightforward, and then it turns out it's a lot more complicated than we thought, and we really need to follow the data. It's a field, though, that kind of drives me a bit nuts, not in terms of the scientists working in it, because most of them are extremely good, but in terms of the media perception of it. And so there's this perception that, oh, my God, we're all epigenetically doomed because of what our parents mm. did, yeah. um, because we'll get abnormalities in these regions and so on. And it's the example I always use is, you, no, you cannot say, that you weigh 280 pounds because granddad once ate a donut. That's not how it works. These are very subtle changes and you can pick them up in laboratory conditions because mice are very inbred. You can keep them in very normal, uh, very tightly controlled situations. You can give them one huge stimulus. That's completely different from humans. Even if this ever happens in humans, we'll only ever detect it at a population level, not at a individual level. So it's it's really important this doesn't become another thing that people beat parents over the head with to go, oh my God, be careful. Who knows what epigenetically you'll do to future generations? Everyone needs to chill about that a little bit. Well, I mean, uh, you're doing your best to kind of dampen down the hype, but I mean, it's an extremely exciting area of research, oh, it's right? it's great. And it's fantastic. I mean, it's just... It's so exciting because it's completely what we didn't think could happen. We still don't quite know how it happens. It's opening up all sorts of possibilities for understanding biology. Um, but again, we have to be very careful about where it is on the hype cycle. And it's 
It's also the other thing that's a real problem with epigenetics is that it is such a seductive complex uh, concept because you can pretty much speculate an epigenetic explanation for almost anything. So often when I give talks to say 18 year old students, they will start asking me, could epigenetics be important for this situation or that situation? And I have to explain to them that I could come up with a possible epigenetic hypothesis for almost anything they want to throw at me, but that doesn't mean I would be right. And it doesn't even mean it would be testable. And so, yeah, that's the other reason epigenetics got a bad press in the scientific community is that it became, <clears throat> excuse me, very easy for, there's a, there's a standing joke of if somebody asks you in biology and especially in genetics, what the explanation is for something you don't know, you just say, it's probably epigenetic. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some of the time it will be epigenetic, a lot of the time it won't be, but it's, um, it's a fun field. Well, you were very careful in the book to avoid any um, hint of, you know, Rudyard Kipling-esque uh, claims, <laughs> but um, but I kind of wanted you to go in that direction. So, you know, a lot of the evolutionary biologists would say, folks like you, you know, you focus on the proximate causes and, and you know, the mechanisms and so forth. And, you know, when you do talk about kind of the function, you, you know, you focus on gene repair and, you know, avoiding birth defects and so forth. But I mean, when we think about the intergenerational transmission of some of these traits, I mean, I look at it and I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an ingenious way to, you know, respond m to environments that are changing more quickly than genetic time, yeah. right? So if, if your mother Absolutely. is starved, right? I mean, it would make sense for you to, to, to be, have a different that, metabolism. That's exactly right? it. I mean, the way that I think about it is that it's a system that, allows biological tweaking, this inheritance of epigenetic characteristics. So most of the time, the Darwinian Mendelian model, absolutely right on the money. You know, that is the important bit. We pass on our DNA variations. But every so often there is a situation where there's a real advantage to having offspring who are responding to an environment differently. And the classic example is the Dutch hunger winter. So this was this period of extreme calorific restriction in the Netherlands during the end of the Second World War. And you could pick up the consequences of that in the generation who were in the womb during the Dutch hunger winter. Now, you can also often in animal populations in the laboratory pick up different responses to nutrition. And I think what this is, the epigenetic passing on of that is it's a bit of biological tweaking. So the offspring and maybe even their offspring come out of the womb prepared for an extreme situation. So if there's, if there's very few nutrients when they're in the womb, it means that by epigenetic tweaking or particular patterns of gene expression, those offspring are able to make the best use of nutrition when they come out of the womb because they, their cells have been primed for this. And maybe they pass that on to their offspring. And so they have an advantage as well. But they've done it using epigenetics. What they've never changed is the underlying genetic code. We know they're not doing it through changing the genetic code because it happens at too high a frequency. Um, and so what this does is it gives you a sort of a safety net because most of the time, the genetic code is pretty much the best one you're gonna get because it's evolved over hundreds of millions, billions of years. It's the code that works best in most circumstances. But if you go to the extremes, like extreme lack of nutrition, then it's useful to have a system that allows you to compensate for that a bit, but without changing that underlying code that most of the way is useful. So I, I think of epigenetics intergenerationally as a bit of a safety net. It just gives you a bit more wiggle room as an, or, as an organism, and especially as an organism that's having offspring. Mm -hmm. But what you don't want to do is change the code that most of the time serves you best. So yeah, it's, it's just an, it's a tweak to the system. It's a very interesting tweak. But how then does it get into the germ cells, right? So, you know, you had to explore a couple of these paths. So some people would say, well, if it does, it's because, 
you know, the, the egg cells of the female fetus are, you know, being formed in that environment. But then you, you, you highlight how sometimes it, it gets transmitted through the male line. Now that I, yeah. I, I hadn't, hadn't really thought about that, but that seems extraordinary. So doing experiments with female mammals, um, even mice, is complex because you've got the actual environment of the, the mouse itself, plus what's happening in its uterus, plus the amount of change within the uterus, et cetera. So now almost all of those experiments are done through the male line, because that gets rid of all the confounding factors. You're just looking at basically what the sperm passed on. And it is really difficult to envisage what's happening because most of the epigenetic information in the sperm gets wiped away when the zygote is formed. So how on earth does it then pass on information? Now, the details are still horribly hazy on all of this, but the best model at the moment is that it's not that the epigenetic information is being passed on directly in those modifications to DNA. It's that what's happening is regions of junk DNA are being activated. They're producing RNA molecules, so the messenger molecule. That gets passed on from the sperm into the zygote. And that sets up patterns of gene expression, which then lead to the creation of the epigenetic modifications. So you see the same epigenetic modifications in the, say the um, brain cells of the father mouse and the baby mouse, but they weren't passed on directly. It went from epigenetic modification to change, changes in RNA level to the RNA setting up new epigenetic modifications. That's our best working theory at the moment. There's still an awful lot of gaps in there. It's still very black box. But what we do know these days is that the phenomenon does happen. And that's the most important thing to have established in many ways. Because if we know the phenomenon is real, then we can start investigating it biologically and mechanistically. But it's, um, yeah, it's horribly complicated. The, the problem with talking about epigenetics is at some point you always go, yeah, it's really complicated. None of it's black and white. It's all gray areas. And you realize that you're answering every question with various forms of words that say the same thing. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, you know, it's very difficult to run experiments on people. So <laughs> you've got to stick with Yeah, them. yeah. They're, they're, you know, it, it's considered not good form. Um, and, and humans are a terrible, terrible experimental species. We're just useless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we, we take a really long time to reproduce. We are very, very different genetically, and we live in very complex, very different environments. We're the worst possible species you could imagine to try to do experiments on. So this is why stuff is done in mice, because they're well, nice and convenient. Well, I've seen a lot of studies that where they look at, you know, twins separated at birth, mm-hmm. right? And they try to yeah. figure out, you know, what's genetic and what's not. And, you know, there they've, I think, just looked at the DNA. But, I mean, have they done the kind of in-depth analysis of the DNA that has updated it from, you know, yeah, what we were doing um, 10 years ago? You have to be really careful with these experiments of twins separated at birth, because there are relatively few identical twins these days who are separated at birth. And um, even when that used to be more common, what you typically found was the twins tended to be placed in very similar environments, yeah. which so that confounded everything. What we do know from work that's been carried out by researchers in Spain is that if you look at the blood of identical twins when they're born and you look at their epigenetic modifications, the DNA methylation, they're really similar. If you then go back to those twins 20 years later and you look at the blood, they're epigenetically quite different Mm. and they get more different the older they get. And some of that will be in response to the environment. They will have had different environmental stimuli and some of it is probably random um you know stuff just happens and again in biology we of course never say stuff just happens we say stochastic variation which sounds so much better than random stuff but random stuff happens and the epigenetic system is has evolved to be dynamic and so it's not surprising that it has a lot of noise built into it and epigenetic systems because they're noisy, they always have this capability to shift. So you get variation and you get what's called epigenetic drift. Um, So the twin stuff is interesting. I think also though one has to be very aware that an awful lot of twin work is not much better than anecdotal. Mm 
and you have to be incredibly careful how you interpret it, especially if you interpret anything that's non-molecular. If you're looking at things like behaviours or what people tell you, because none of us can come up with an absolutely accurate description of ourselves or our own lives. So the molecular, I think, with the twins tells us much more than the sociological. Well, in the, both books, you talk a lot about kind of various pathologies, you know, these unusual defects which highlight some aspect of our, our DNA. And, you know, when you read about these things, you, 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 you realize, I mean, I'm astonished at how rare these things are because... Uh-huh. You know, when, you, when you're copying, if you, if you take something to the copier and you copy it, you know, 64 <laughs> times or, you know, you do whisper down the lane. I mean, there are so many things that could go wrong. And it seems like yeah. there are all of these checks and balances and, and, and regulators. And there, there are these um, f- these functionalities which will uh, proofread and, uh, and you know, look for defects and, and, and fix them. And, you know, it's, it's astonishing how complicated that is. It's almost like we, we have more... I mean, it's like in the modern economy, right? We have, you know, more regulators <laughs> than, than we have, uh, you know, producers because things are so complicated, right? Absolutely. I think when you think about human reproduction, actually any mammalian reproduction, and you think about how a fetus develops, I'm astonished anyone is ever born ever, mm-hmm. you know, because it is such a complex system. On the other hand, it's had billions of years to evolve, um, but it will never be perfect. Um, there will always be things that can go wrong and they can go wrong because the DNA is slightly off or they can go wrong because something goes wrong with the epigenetic system. But the degree of checks and balances is absolutely phenomenal. Um, But it's also one of the things that makes me think, yeah, I'm not convinced by this stuff about the natural human lifespan is going to be 150, 200 years old Mm -hmm. because I don't think we've evolved that. Our biological systems just haven't evolved. Um, But it is kind of remarkable that any of us get born, let alone get to our age. It seems incredible with everything that can go wrong, but it works. And it it works, I think, just because evolution's had an incredibly long time to play around with these systems. Right, and so there are a couple of things that could go wrong. Um, Cancer, of course, is one. And you talk about the role of telomeres, right? And telomere shortening and the trade-off between cancer and, and aging. You also yeah. talk about, and I'll have you, I wanted to hear about that, but you also talk about these, um, you know, retroviruses. And what, what I found, fa- I had heard about how people might get um, organs donated by pigs, let's say, and then they would come down with these crazy diseases. But I, I, I kept thinking that they were viruses, but yeah. they are in fact, vet retroviruses sometimes. <laughs> they are. We, um, we have embedded in our genomes um, hundreds of thousands, millions of copies of ancient viruses, some of which can be reactivated. And animals have the same as well. Um, when I wrote the three books, they were all designed as envisaged as standalone books. But what I find really extraordinary is that the epigenetic system, for example, one of its roles is to control these endogenous retroviruses, Mm -hmm. to keep them switched off. Um, So that's one of the things that I didn't really expect when I first started writing the second book. Um, And one of the problems that we've, people have worried about is that if you start taking, say, pig hearts and putting them into humans who require a new heart, that our systems will not be as good at keeping those retroviruses from the pig under control. Um, And so there's been a concern that that could lead to the recipients getting viral infections that could kill them. And even worse, that could then spread from those people into the general population. And these would would be be viruses that would be, you know, novel, right? Unrecognized. They they would be novel. We we would not have had experience, exposure to them. So our immune systems would be entirely unprepared for them. And so to get around this, um, there have been various labs and various companies working on, well, is there a way of controlling this? And George Church's lab in, uh, in Boston, one of the things that they're doing is they're using gene editing to take out or inactivate some of these particularly virulent retroviruses um, in pig hearts. So 
I found it really bizarre because it meant my three books tied together in a way that I had never expected, that gene editing could then be used to control the junk DNA, which is normally controlled by epigenetics. I would like to say I was extraordinarily prescient about the, all this, but I wasn't. It just happened all to come along at the same time. But it means that we have new ways into things like potential transplantation that maybe in the future we can start using organisms other than humans for this because there is a huge shortage of organ donors. Mm. Um, it's the law of unintended consequences, certainly in Europe, is that we brought in seatbelt legislation, which was terrific for everybody in a car. Pretty terrible if you're on a transplant waiting list, because that's where so many of the transplanted organs used to come from. So we need new approaches. But it is, um, I think we will find every new medical approach always throws up problems that we didn't expect, because we simply don't understand enough about biology. We understand a lot. And it's amazing stuff, but there will always be these weird curveballs that evolution has come up with because evolution never expected us to want to transplant hearts from other organs, mm -hmm. other animals. Right. But you also talk about cell senescence. And, you know, there are a lot of people, particularly here in Silicon Valley, think that they can kind of, you know, engineer these infinite <laughs> lifespans. I mean, if, if that does lead to, say, more cancer like cell activity, I mean, could we not just use a little gene editing there to kind of regulate well, that and keep that yeah, under wraps? Yeah, I am. Um, so one of the problems is that uh, our cells walk an extraordinary tightrope tight rope between proliferating just enough to keep organs healthy and not proliferating so much and in an abnormal way so they cause cancer. And there comes a point when cells cannot divide anymore. They just reach the end of their divisive life. And some of this is controlled by the bits at the end of chromosomes called telomeres. The aglets. And they get aglets. I, love the aglets, I have the to say, by the way, you, the your, your use of metaphor in your books <laughs> is phenomenal. There's so many amazing metaphors in all three books. Thank you very much. So yeah, the telomeres are like the bits on the end of shoelaces that stop them unraveling. Um, and they get shorter as we get older. The thing is, if you use genetic approaches to make the telomeres long again, you also increase the rate of cancer in organisms. So we were walking a sort of biological tightrope and I am not convinced we will massively expand lifestyle, uh, lifespan. And even if we do, what becomes really important is expanding healthy lifespan. I, me, I'm not so interested in, um, if, if I'm honest, as a person, I am not so interested in a few tech billionaires being able to live to 120. I'm much more interested in more people being able to live a healthier lifespan to a sensible kind of age. Um, and we also have to remember, of course, that population growth on Earth is driven by us old people not dying. It's not driven by increased birth rates. It's driven by falling death rates. So you could say the last thing that we want is most of us living an awful lot longer. Um, I'm sure I'll change my opinion on that the older I get. <laughs> right. Well, so the, the, the core fact in the Junk DNA book, which is that, you know, when we compare humans to these other organisms, you know, we have just a lot more genetic content, right? Um, we do. It depends slightly on how you measure it. So there are things like plant species. Plants are really complicated. They seem to work march to their own tune. Um, but and and you do find odd organisms that have a huge amount of junk DNA. But one of the things that seems to be different about humans is that we have a huge amount of DNA that doesn't code for protein and that we use it we can see that it's expressed a lot more than it is in other species, and particularly that it's expressed in our brains. And it might be one of the reasons our brains are so complex. Right. And so, I mean, is that account for, you know, a lot of people talk about how humans are so adaptable, right, and can, in, you know, survive in lots of different environments. I mean, do you think that if we dig deeper, we, we will find that there's a connection between the complexity of our... I Genes yeah. and the complexity of our, you know, capacity to. I think it is. I mean, everything that is successful about humans is essentially successful because of our cognition. We're not the strongest. We're not the fastest. We're not the biggest. You know, there's nothing about our physical attributes that makes us outcompete other species. Mm -hmm. It's our brains that have made us mm 
much more adaptable than any other species on the planet. It is also probably what's killing the planet is the fact we are so good at this. Um, but that is to do with our brains and it has made us supremely adaptable. And we're only at the real beginning of understanding why our brains are so complicated compared with other species. But one of the areas might be to do with the fact that we have repurposed junk DNA to give us massively more sophisticated control in our neurons and in our brains. And so we just have a degree of um, molecular flexibility in our brains that you just don't see in other species. But no one thing is going to be the only answer to this. There are good, it's gonna be complex systems working together again. And a kind of complexity that may only have arisen once in the universe. You know, it is such an extraordinary evolutionary lottery. You know, there is nothing to, there is no reason why we should have evolved, we just happened to. And it's certainly looking like the junk regions of the brain, uh, of the genome are really important in that. Well, when people talk about the power of the human brain, I mean, they're not talking about the number of cells, they're talking about the number of possible connections, right? So- Exactly. And so it seems like junk DNA, it, it's, it uses this Lego concept or this modularity that, that you talk about. Um, and it seems to, the modularity of it is what enables you to have so many different possible configurations with this relatively limited amount of code dedicated to protein creation, right? Yeah, absolutely. That does seem to be part of it. And you're right. The It's the connections between neurons. We have um, hundreds of millions of neurons, if not billions, making extraordinary numbers of connections. I really like the statement, though I can't remember who made it, that the human brain is the most complex three pounds of matter in the universe. Um, and it is quite extraordinary. We, we know that how the connections are made is re are really important, also how connections are lost. So lots of connections get made, which are then pruned away. So you create what I guess become self-reinforcing networks and these are really, really complex in humans. But I suspect it's going to be a situation that it will again be one of those things where it's the entirety of all the biological systems working together in the brain that make it so phenomenal. So it will be the connections, but it will also be the how the RNAs are expressed. It will be how the epigenetic information is processed. It will be other factors as well, some of which we probably have no idea about yet. And so it's, again, it's not a situation where we should be looking for one simple explanation because that's so unlikely with something this complicated. Right, now the big chunk of the book is you talk about RNA and messenger RNA, and I uh, love your PDF uh, metaphor in there. Uh, but I mean, when you were writing these books, I mean, you probably could not have imagined that we would be able to develop, right, a, a vaccine so quickly for a new pathogen like the coronavirus, yeah. right? I mean, do you think that the amount of research that went into that has led to some discontinuity? Uh, in terms of what's possible going forward? Um, I think what the coronavirus pandemic demonstrated and the vaccine response to it was actually the power of human innovation and human communities working together. Um, because when faced with a global pandemic of immediate and acute significance, you had industry and universities and government and finance organizations, et cetera, all piling in together to do something. And that I think, that was massively important, but also what was hugely important with the vaccine work was the fact that it built on 20, 30 years of basic research. Um, and something that I think governments forget, and certainly our government in the UK forgets, is you cannot turn these things on like a tap. Mm -hmm. You can only, you're only going to get great water gushing out of the tap if you connected it to the water supply 30 years ago. Um, and so we need all that basic biology and then we need the political will to make things happen. So in terms of the vaccine, it was very much a, an example of great science, but great science that had been going on for 20 or 30 years and that what it required was the right infrastructure 
to, to make the vaccines happen. It's an, it's an incredible achievement. I mean, I, I'm not saying it was routine. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and I'm very happy that I've worked at the University of Oxford because they were instrumental in one of the vaccines. I'm very happy that one of the previous companies I worked for was Pfizer because it's mm-hmm. you know, also instrumental. I had absolutely nothing to do with the vaccines. I'm just basking in reflected glory here. Um, but it was as much a triumph of logistics and science And I think that's really worth remembering. The thing that I have found the extraordinary game changer that I think absolutely couldn't anticipate back in 2011 when I wrote The Epigenetics Revolution was gene editing. It was CRISPR. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a technology that has matured so fast and has been commoditized in the sense of being usable by so many scientists so quickly. CRISPR is one of the most extraordinary game changers. I feel very excited that we live in this period of biology um, and because that's been incredible. Well, you know, you've had a role as a visiting professor, but also as an entrepreneur in residence. And so you've sort of yeah. had one foot in the academy and one foot in industry. Um, you know, when we look at all the things that are happening in the world of, you know, AI, right? I mean, most mm-hmm. of that innovation is happening now out in industry. Um, yeah. But in the world of, of, of biology, it's still a game that has um, a lot of academic presence. And, and you, you know, you, you cite all of these wonderful academic researchers in the book and only parenthetically mention some of the kind of industry folks and the patents and whatever. I mean, do you, do you think that this now that we're sort of maybe over the hump in some of these areas, like in the cost of uh, doing a genome sequences? relatively inexpensive. I mean, will we see industry kind of taking over the mantle of, you know, doing a lot of the cutting edge research in this area? Um, I think we've sometimes seen that anyway, particularly in drug discovery. Um, if you look at companies like Genentech, who you know, have been extraordinary at doing really basic biology. Um, but then the same used to be true in physics, you know, places like Bell Labs, et cetera, and IBM, you know, did a lot of the cutting edge stuff. I think what's different in biology, especially in basic biology, is the systems are so complex and there is, it would be impossible to have companies that can do the breadth of research that is done by curiosity driven scientists working in academia. I think what works really fantastically well is when you have great people in academia working with great people in industry. Mm -hmm. But I think the two sectors do different things and they each do them really well. I think the worst scenario would be to have industry just messing about with bits of basic research that they didn't do very well and academics trying to do the bits that industry do really well. Where you see the greatest benefits are when the two are able to talk to each other. but in my mind, we have to keep funding basic and basic research and we have to keep funding it for the public good because we never know what the next bit of curiosity driven research, which will lead to the technology that will 20 years save us from the next pandemic or will enable us to grow crops with less damage to ecosystems, etc. We need these. They're two different, very different cultures and they do different things and they do them beautifully when they work well. Now, yeah, you had this wonderful quote, and I forget who you were citing in the, one of the books. It says that discovery is to see what everyone else sees, but yes. to think what no one else has thought. I um, love that. What, is, what are some of the, I mean, because in this field, right, we've seen uh, all these new discoveries. I mean, you, you, you go yeah. back to, you know, Darwin and Mendel and then go forward to, you know, Watson and Crick and fast forward to what's happening here in this epigenetics revolution. Um, what what kind of frame of mind is is needed for these discoveries to take place? I mean, because it's easy and it's easy as an academic researcher to I mean, everyone wants to do great discoveries, but you point out that you know disproving something is you know you can you can do the same experiment a hundred times and not get the results, and it's on the hundred and first yeah. time that you get the results, and and you could have quit at any point prior to that. So what what is needed for people to you know, have that hunger to discover things? Yeah, I think what we need to do is to support the really creative researchers in ways which give them longer term funding and more stability. Um, 
if we're in the situation which you see a lot in the US, you see a lot in the UK, which are the two systems I'm most familiar with, researchers are often funded for short periods of time. And no one can do high risk work under those circumstances because you've got to get your next publication, which will have to be positive data. And you've got to do that before you'll get your next grant. And I think we need to revert to systems where people are given more time to mature in terms of creativity and to tackle big questions. I'm not sure we should fund everyone like that because I used to be an academic and I'm very good at small questions. I'm very good at hmm, how does that work? I'll try and work it out. You know, And I, I was good at working in industry because it was very defined projects. Um, I'm a problem solver. I'm not really a creative person. We have to find good ways of really identifying those people in biology who are really creative, who think differently. Um, my The other quote that I love is from Isaac Asimov, who said, most great discoveries in science don't come because someone shouts Eureka. They come because somebody thinks, that's funny. And they actually have the confidence to see the bigger question within there and pursue that. So I think we have to get better at recognizing that not all scientists are the same. Some are really good problem solvers. Some are really good creative thinkers. And it's about finding the right ways to support those people to maximum effect. And we need both. We need the problem solvers as well as the genuinely deeply creative people. Um, and that's expensive. But on the other hand, you don't get the great breakthroughs. If we only had the problem solvers, all we would have now are better iron lungs for polio. We'd never have a vaccine. Um, but sometimes you need those problem solvers just to get other things done as well. So, so we need to be supporting all different types of researchers, I think. But we need to remember it's, it's a long-term game, but I'm always really reluctant to think of it in terms of it's just about investment. You know, all research R&D in science, and the same is true in the arts, actually. If you look at the big picture, it, for every, say in the UK, for every pound that we spend on R&D, across all the disciplines, we get at least eight pounds back in economic improvement. I suspect the figures are very similar for the US. But I also think it's a mistake just to think we should fund science because eventually it will fund us back. We should fund science because it's beautiful. We should fund it because it's a magnificent cultural activity that adds to the wealth of human gorgeousness in the same way that fine art does mm -hmm. and great literature does. You know, stuff shouldn't just be funded because it has an economic imperative. Isn't it just beautiful to understand more about how the world works? Well, it is fascinating. And I would say that if anybody's interested in going from the uh, highly detailed discussion of exons and introns all the way up to the very high level description of this new modular paradigm and the missing link between nature and nurture. Um, be sure to check out the epigenetics revolution, which is still really good in uh, junk DNA and hacking the code of life. Vanessa, thanks so much for joining me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Greg. It's been such a pleasure. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.